Good morning. I nearly said Thursday. It's not Thursday yet, is it? It's only Tuesday. I don't know about you, but I'm really getting confused with my days. So here we are, Tuesday morning, 7 a.m. New line at Waterfall. Beautiful morning. Very still. It's a very still morning. Good morning, Francis. Good morning, Mag. Right, let's get a go. Let's get started. Right, good morning. Step into gear. Um, challenging subject again. Because it's so complex, I think, to try and condense it into the sound bite of a message. So, imposter syndrome. Feeling like a fraud. Feeling that in your job any minute somebody's going to tap you in the shoulder and catch you out for being an imposter. Now, imposter syndrome, syndrome, don't necessarily like that word. Uh, that's why, as I titled it, feeling, feeling like a fraud. Seems a little bit more aligned with me. I don't know if it is a syndrome. It's not a disease. It doesn't fall into a mental health category. But, let's say, do you feel like an imposter? Do you feel like a fraud. Now, statistics would say that 70% of people feel like they're an imposter, that they're going to get. Can you sort of... Is that better, Max? Hello? Hello? Is that better? Let me know if that's better, Mags, or I'll just pull it out. Well, I'm not hearing back from you. I'll just pull it out. Right, good morning. Imposter syndrome. So I don't see it as a syndrome. That's why I've titled this uh, vlog this morning, Feeling Like a Fraud. Now, do you feel like you're an imposter? Do you feel that somebody's going to tap you on the shoulder? Give you a little nudge and say, can I get a wee word with you? We've caught you. You're caught. You are a imposter. Good morning, Harv. Now, the statistics would tell us that 70% of people have an issue around about feeling like they're going to get caught out, feeling like they're an imposter, feeling like they're a fraud, feeling like the world is going to one day chap their door and say, you know, you've been telling lies, you've been telling stories about yourself, you're a fraud, you're an imposter, you're caught, you're coming with us. It's a very common syndrome. And regrettably, the out of the 70%, I believe that 70% of that 70%, the research tells us that it's women that feel this. I think the study was originally carried out in the 70s which I guess time's changed a lot since then. But what makes women feel that they're, they're an imposter in their career um, against men? You know, that's open for discussion. It's certainly open for thought. So are any of you walking about your current career, your job, you're walking around in it and you've got this feeling of OMG, big speech bubble pops out the top of your head, I'm actually a fraud. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm going to get caught out and get turfed to the wolves. So if that is the case, if that's a feeling, the feeling that goes along with that is a massive amount of fear, a huge amount of dissociation, a lack of self-esteem, lack of self-confidence, lack of self-belief. Now, where does it originate? So for me, the way I think, and again, you can challenge the way I think, it's the way I think, it's the way that I've studied, is that these conditions can be set up in childhood. Constantly waiting and tapping the shoulder, Francis. Well, ditto, I've got a screen in front of me. Now, childhood, why was it set up in childhood? It was set up in childhood because as a child, as a four-year-old, it was very, very... We, we had placed a massive amount of meaning on our parents. A massive amount of meaning. 
a massive, a massive amount that they were right. And we couldn't understand how they would do what they would do and they weren't interested in jumping about on a trampoline and just, you know, lying about on the floor. Um, why did they sit in chairs, you know, perplexed? Also, the praise that we got. You know, look at the... Look at parents. Not everybody's had this, but... Look at parents that were at work, the managing director or the CEO of a company, but when dad or mum came home, they were very volatile or perhaps had alcohol or substance misuse challenges or would hide away quiet or was a very meek and shy man, whereas at his work. So it shows this real polarity between who the person was presenting to the world and who the person actually was or is. Now, human beings sense their self from the inside out. So I have a sense of myself from the inside out. I understand myself from the inside out. But I understand you from the outside in. I can only understand you from what it is that you're projecting to the world. So if you're projecting to the world confidence, sharpness, um, business acumen, um, intelligence, uh, driven, uh, polite and kind to the world, then I take that at face value and that's how I would interpret you. Whereas inside myself, I've got all these little nagging, chattering voices. I've got a whole community of inner critics that are talking to me all the time. I think that's only me that feels like that. I couldn't begin to imagine that you would feel unassured, not confident, have no self-esteem because, you know, you don't get out of bed depressed and walk. You, you put a face on. We put that face on, that mask that we present to the world and that's how I interpret you and that would be how you would interpret me. So I interpret me from the inside out. I interpret you from the outside in. It's a subjective experience versus an objective experience, but let's not make it complicated. Um, Francis, I'd like to read your comment, but I'm buzzling along this road here. So... Do you feel as if you have imposter syndrome, feeling as if you're going to get caught, feeling as if you don't have the right to be here, feeling as if on any minute now the ground's going to open up and swallow you up because you're an imposter? Now, it's been a long, long time since I've researched any of this. Um, one of my teachers, if you like, um, he's used a model <clears throat> and he would call it feelings of fraud. And I was trying to I was trying to find these models. It's, it's been ages. I mean, um, it's been ages since I since I did any work with him. And it was like feelings of fraud was down. He worked with a triangular model, and I distinctively remember that feelings of fraud were down round about like dead zone and burnout. Now, if you are, um, depending on the bigger the character or the more identified you are with the role. R-O-L-E, the role that you're presenting to the world and the degree to which you feel like an imposter would mean to me the extent to which you've dissociated from any true self or who you really are. You've stepped away from that and developed this personality or persona that quite rightly you would feel as a fraud because it's not necessarily true to who you are, Right? That is going to make you more susceptible to burn out and feeling as if life's just dead, as if there's not any colour in your world. And then from my mindset, looking at the world through the lens of addiction, it's when you're in those stages of burnout, dead zone type feelings, feelings like fraud, that alcohol or substance misuse would be a would be a a go-to because it would give you a, a sense of it would loosen up the constructs it would let the role the personality dissolve somewhat and when you've had a couple of shandies or a couple of sherbets you feel a little bit more loose a little bit more almost like who you are 
But again, that's not true. And that's when we see people are using alcohol and substances as a mechanism to take them away from those very deep-rooted feelings of fraudulence and that they're an imposter. So I could give you loads of examples about it and keep on rolling about it, but what's the important thing here? The important thing and what to do with it is start to name it. So for those of you that don't know, I'm not just some guy that's walking about here. Well, I am. I'm just a guy that's out walking about with his dog in the morning and decided to talk to his phone. But uh, I've been working as a counsellor uh, post-qualifying since 2008. And the majority of that work that I do is around about substance and alcohol um, addiction. Hate that word, but that's what I do. And you get to see the many um, dualities of substance and alcohol misuse when you're working at that level with it. People use drugs and alcohol for many different reasons. But this one here, this imposter syndrome, seems to be very prevalent. And as I said, predominantly more in women. I mean, if you look at the stats, um, Google, love love Google. Google's like God now, isn't it? It's uh, like more people Google, twice as many people Google as my son a genius than as my daughter a genius, right? And twice as many people Google as my, as my daughter, does my daughter have an eating disorder twice as much as they do a boy? Is my daughter fat twice as much as they do a boy? Okay, so it's back to that real conditioning that I guess that we've had around women and how society has treated women as second class citizens. It's less uh, predominant to see in the United Kingdom now and if you're probably under 30 and you're watching this, you won't have any understanding about what I'm saying. But two, one, you know, think outside the box, one generation back, two generations back, three generations back. Goodness, women weren't allowed to vote until the 60s contraception, the pill, women's movement, freedom, that's relatively new on the larger scheme of things. I choose to think about imposter syndrome more from a metaphysical point of view because I'm interested in spirituality and I have a keen interest in unified fields of consciousness versus separated consciousness. So I like to think of it as, and I relate everything back to that metaphorical place in the Garden of Eden, uh, where we were authentic or, you know, is that book, I'm not banging religion, always make a point of saying that, a phenomenon book, that, that book of creation, how we were innocent until we disobeyed and ate the fruit from the forbidden tree and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if grace, oneness, feelings of connection and love is our natural state, and walking with the angels and feeling peace and love is our natural state. And boom, spirit or our soul um, comes into this body and lands in this world. We never feel that we're at home. We never feel that we're at home in this world. So from my perspective, I do see it from a psychological narrative. But I also just like to play and think and ponder on a more metaphorical meaning behind the imposter syndrome. Because as long as we are separated from a unified field of consciousness, the internal narrative is, I don't belong here. I don't belong in this world, right? Now, you could be an atheist and still feel that. You could be an atheist and still feel that you don't belong in this body or in this, or in this, this place that you've inhabited. And now with LGBT and we're looking at gender neutral and gender indifferent things, people come along and they have got a, a, a real sense, real sense that they do not belong in this body. They're a boy and they feel as if they're a woman in this body or they're a girl and they feel like a boy in this body or they just don't feel as if they belong in this body. And when we start to talk about this kind of stuff, if you're listening and you're thinking as I'm walking, have you ever thought that you don't belong in this body, that you don't belong in this place, that somewhere you've just been beamed down? But you shun those thoughts, you put those thoughts down. You know, and predominantly when we start to get uh, promotions, like 
if you're a CEO of a company or, a run, or an owner of a company, the, the, the distance between who you really are and who you have to project in that office because you can't be, ah, you can't say to everybody, yeah, you can get whatever holiday that you put in. When you get up to that level and you're managing 100, 200, 300 people, you have to approach that with a sense of authority. You have to approach that with a sense of a boundary to be a good leader. You have to be approachable. So you've got to really manage and wear many masks and many hats in order to be an effective leader. Now, if you're not doing that from a place of authenticity and you're managing that as a role, because really the minute you get in the car after a day at the office, you undo the tie, you let the steam out from underneath your shirt and you feel absolutely exhausted and you've only been in the office for eight hours, then there's something going on that we need to look at. So, we're talking about imposter syndrome, feeling like a fraud, feeling like you're going to get caught out. Statistics tell us that a massive amount of people feel that. I'm repeating myself, let's get back to what do we do about it. Okay, I pull this, always pull this back because I was introduced to the fellowship, the 12-step process um, of recovery. Um, I looked at that model for and around, before and around when I entered into personal therapy in 1993 and um, I was in personal therapy um, from 93 to 96 so it was around about then that I coincided personal therapy and the 12-step process so then my timeline is I then went to study and get into counselling and get into the work that I do much later on in my life and and the 12th step has always been a backbone to how I have um, construed. It's like, it's a lens, it's an umbrella that I look through the world at. So why am I talking about that when we're looking at imposter syndrome? If anybody's ever asked me, what's your favourite steps? Well, I love them all, but my favourite is 1 and 12. Step 1 and step 12, right? But they're all unique, and I'm not belittling any other any anyone more than the other okay but when we're looking at imposter syndrome <clears throat> we're feeling like a fraud we're feeling like we don't belong well what's the 12 step process got to do with that for imposter syndrome the most healing thing that we can do is talk about it find a safe place now as with all of this i'm not expecting you to get on the bus when this lockdown appears and sit down and goes do you know what I learned when I was uh, when I was in lockdown? I learned that you know I'm just a fraud, and then you know you realise that the bus driver is a fraud. And that starts to become really scary when you realise that the pilot is a fraud. Is he really a pilot? <coughs> <coughs> but if seventy percent of the people statistically feel like a fraud and feel like an imposter then it's highly likely that you've been on a plane with a pilot that feels like an imposter, that feels like any minute now he's going to get caught out. You've been in a taxi with a taxi driver that feels like a fraud, that feels like an imposter. And I'm going to share something with you. If you've sat in my therapy room, and if I've ever worked with any of you, you've been sitting across from somebody that's got an internal narrative that he doesn't feel good enough to be doing this and that he feels like an imposter, right? So, the most healing way through imposter syndrome for me is step one and step 12. Talk about it. Bring, an, bring a degree of acceptance to it. Bring a degree, and there, Bob's just come in. Bob drives trucks. Bob's listening. Wonder if Bob ever thinks I walk into a yard here and I don't know how to do this, but I'm just going to have to do my best to tie this load down because I've never tied it down before. But man, what if somebody's looking on my shoulder? Right, he's probably got about 40 tonne of steel in the back of his trailer and his flatbed and he's bringing it up the road. You know, when you start to think about it, it can arise a lot of fear. So, talking about it, step one, find a safe place. No, just the woman in the beside you in the bus. No, anybody, no, no going in and telling your boss. Find a safe, open space that you can talk about these very deep-rooted feelings that you're an imposter, that you're a fraud, that you, you feel like you don't belong, right? And step 12. 
Step 12, for me, let's change the language a little bit, but it's encouragement. Now, if you've got imposter syndrome and you're a good looking girl or a good looking boy, right? And somebody says to you, you're stunning, you're gorgeous, you're a lovely looking girl. If you don't feel that about yourself, that person's compliment will actually feel like a knife wound. It'll feel like an attack. So you shun it off. No, 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 no. Don't be daft. Don't be daft. So people that are experiencing imposter syndrome find it very, very hard to deal with compliments. But one of the reasons why they find it difficult to deal with compliments is because they don't think about that as their self. And in order for them to accept that, okay, they would have to, there would have to be a healing, right? There would have to be a risk involved in that. And similarly for guys. So if you notice anybody that's in your world that finds it very difficult to accept a compliment, and I'm being really basic here, they've probably got some kind of imposter syndrome or feeling like a fraud. As I said at the beginning, I don't think it's a syndrome, but if you Google it, that's what you'll find it as. So, again, with all these wee vlogs, these are just my opinions. It's very difficult. I always, I always hang up and think, damn, I should have said this, or damn, I should have said that, or damn, I should have said another thing. And, um, and I don't. And... It's very difficult to convey, for me, I find it very difficult to convey um, meaning of what I'm attempting to get across in a soundbite of a 20 minute clip. But I would always encourage you, these feelings are real. 70, we, we, you know, look at uh, our mental health in our country, just Scotland, look at the mental health. Look at the levels of suicide. Look at the levels of uh, self-harm. It just breaks my heart. It absolutely breaks my heart to see the amount of suffering that's in our world. I'm going on Facebook, you know, at nights, and the amount of people that I see actually mascotting their drink, ah, giving a bevy the night, having a bevy the night, having a bevy the night, and putting up pictures of their drink. And I'm just like, I'm not angry. I'm also... I don't sympathise, I don't feel sympathetic towards them. How do I feel? I feel hurt. I feel hurt. Now, somebody that's having to drown their self in at least 750 millilitres of some kind of substance every night, right? They're not happy. Why are they not happy? Because they've maybe not got any self-worth, they've maybe not got any self-esteem, and... The way through this is to accept it, to start talking about it, start to fit. Now, I guess if you went and Googled, I've not, I've not done it, there's a business opportunity. You know, Google uh, groups for imposter syndrome. I don't think there's any in Lamont, that's for sure. But the way through it is to start to talk about it. And it's a very debilitating, um, very harrowing uh very empty place to be when you constantly feel like a failure or a fraud. Look at this. This is this popped into my head earlier on as well. I don't know what it's got to do with it, but I'll share it a little bit as well. Imposter syndrome. Feeling like a fraud. Feeling like you're going to get chapped in the shoulder. Now, I was speaking with a friend the other day there about, you know, labels and clothes and how we, set, how we tend to look after things that we've spent more money on. Now, as my mum used to say to me all the time... Um, I used to wear a pair of jeans with a wee eagle in the back of them and I used to spend a hundred quid on them, say, and my mum would have these Marks and Spencers jeans at a tenner and she would like that, Ross, tell me how they're 90 pounds better quality denim. Now, see in perspective, looking back on it, the denim quality from Marks and Spencers was probably better and harder wearing than the logo that you were paying. So the per perception that you were placing on the material item, the more you spent on it, the better you look after it, right? The more you look after it. Now, why I want to talk about that is the opposite of that is true. If you've came across something for nothing, if you've stole it, if you've acquired it by illegal means, right? Can you fully enjoy it, right? Now, I had a girlfriend, I nearly said a friend, but I had a girlfriend. The harder you work for something, the more you'll appreciate it. And I, I maybe never took that on back then, but I now know that to be true. I value the majority of the things 
that I own rather than the minority of the things I own. Now, if anything that you have in your life that you've acquired, be that your child because you made up a story about his father or your child because you made up a story about his mother or the car that you're driving because you maybe said that you were earning more money than you were earning when you went for the finance on it. I don't know. But if you haven't been 100% honest around about your means and how you've attained that particular thing, you're never going to be able to enjoy it and you'll always be either driving around with it or playing in the swing part with it knowing that there's an element of fraudulence in how you've obtained it, right? And that was just a sidetrack from the imposter syndrome and feeling like a fraud. So, um, yeah, the imposter syndrome. 70% of people are experiencing feeling like they're an imposter, feeling like a fraud, feeling like any minute somebody's going to come up, tap them in the shoulder and say, how you? You're caught, right? Now... And unfortunately and regrettably, the studies are showing that the majority of that 70% are women that are experiencing those things, those feelings. So if that's something that you are challenged with and it's something that you would like to work on, my easy steps to recovery is step one, start talking about it. Start talking about those feelings. Start talking about, you know, that you don't feel that you deserve, etc., 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 and um, when, quite cr- flat, frankly, the external reality would dictate otherwise, you know, um, I was thinking as well as a child when it's brought up in childhood, uh, you somebody got like a an A minus, and the parent would say to them, "I but it's no an A plus," or you went in with a B and they went, "I but it's no a B," or you in with an A plus and the parents able to turn around and go, "I." must be a really easy school that you're at have you got that and it's like bloody hell right when you look back at how parents spoke to their children around about their successes no wonder we're programmed and encoded to have absolutely little self-worth or indeed self-confidence and how we're able to experience ourselves versus somebody else now i've used this example before um by billy conley but Before Billy Conley said it in the 70s or the 80s, it was said by a French philosopher, and it said, Lords and philosophers shit, and so do ladies. Right? And Billy Conley said, Show me somebody in this audience that hasn't wiped their arse and looked at the colour of the shit on their toilet paper. And the reason I'm saying this is that... We know what's going on inside us because we see ourselves from the inside out, but all of us experience the world. We could never look at somebody else, especially lords and ladies, and think for a minute that they're like us, that they are like us, that they have feelings of vulnerability, feelings of shame, feeling that they're a failure because, as I said to my friend the other day there, the thing that makes Kevin Bridges unique is he's able to look at the real life situations that every single one of us look at and deliver it in a comical and funny way to an audience and we're all doing exactly the same stuff. We've all got the same fears, we've all got the same feelings but we've all dissociated into this personality that ah, everything's going alright, we're all doing fine. So, I babbled on again, I wish you all a fantastic, nearly said Friday, fantastic Tuesday have a great day and thanks very much for the support and for tuning in and if you're in the dead zone you don't find any happiness you don't find any success in the world you're constantly judging yourself as a fraud or an imposter I would encourage you to do your own research on it and find ways through it in order to manage it life is way too short to be running about thinking that you're an imposter okay none of us None of us deserve to be here and all of us deserve to be here. Have a great day. All the best.